and I'm going to hit live on YouTube and I'm going to open the webinar. All right, we're live. Hello. Welcome. All right, welcome and welcome YouTube viewers who are out there. Hello. All right, we'll give it just a second. We, we open the door just a, a one minute late. So I'll give it a moment to fill in. The chat is open. It is your river of consciousness in the virtual land. And here's the link to tonight's document. All right, so I'm just gonna get started with library news and information and I'll set up tonight's event. Hello everyone, I'm Anissa. I'm your virtual librarian. Uh, you can find me here lots of nights of the week. Um, so I'm excited that we are here with artists and storytellers tonight. And I wanna thank you all for being here as well. So we are here tonight to hear Nilofar Talibi and Kija Lucas in conversation. And I'm excited about this. But first, our library wants to acknowledge that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Rami Tushaloni peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. And as uninvited guests, we affirm our sovereign rights as we affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples and wish to pay our respect to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Rami Tush community. And I'll throw in the chat an amazing organization out of Oakland, the Segorite Land Trust, um, an amazing group of indigenous women, just, they should just rule the world, check them out. So tonight we are here to talk to, to be, to hear a conversation and dialogue. And I'm sure you can throw your questions or uh, into the chat as well as your comments and we will look at those and get to them. But tonight we are here to talk to Nilofar Talibi and Kija Lucas, discuss the concept of home, a subject Talibi began exploring in 2019 in her hybrid memoir, Self-Portrait in Bloom, and continues to address in her new fiction and nonfiction projects. And with her tonight is Kija Lucas, and you can check out her photography, at SF Camera Works. And I'll put the links for all those. And of course, that link that I provided you is your link to take home. And I'll keep up as they talk. And any any other links they have, I will throw those in. So um, Nilofar Talibi is the author of Self-Portrait in Bloom. And she's calling it, uh, it's been called a hybrid wonder by the rumpus and a brutally honest memoir of life built by words, destroyed by words, rebuilt by words by New York Times bestselling author, Virose Dumas. It breaks with the memoir form and presents a portrait of an Iranian poet, Ahmad Shamlu, and his poetry in her award-winning translation. Lucas is an artist based in San Francisco Bay Area. She uses photography to explore ideas of home, heritage and inheritance. She's interested in how, men, how ideas are passed down and seemingly inconsequential moments create changes that last generations. And again, you can see her work up and I'll put the link into that. I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna turn it over to Nilofar Talibi. Thank you very much, Anissa. I'd like to thank the San Francisco Public Library and you, Anissa, for, um, for giving us this opportunity to have this conversation. Um, I would also like to thank the San Francisco Arts Commission for uh, providing support for this entire project and this talk. And also Kija Lucas for being my uh, partner in arms here tonight uh, for our conversation. Uh, before I forget, I wanted to say that the copies of my book, um, are of course available for sale on the bigger websites. Uh, but I hope that you can also uh, get them on loan through the San Francisco Public Library. Um, our subject matter tonight is home. And it may seem like a very pedestrian subject matter, home, 
a lot of people write about home and talk about home. I started to have several years ago, I started to have uh, a reaction against uh, watching people who are immigrants or refugees or exiles or people who are new to this country or any other country be interrogated about home. I don't I did I couldn't verbalize or articulate years ago why I had this repulsion because it seems sort of uh, obvious that we would as new guests in a country we would be asked about our home but there was something very and I didn't have those words at that time but now I know very colonial at the heart of being uh, interrogated about one's home by persons who uh, are of European descent and whose families had been in the country in which uh, we were adopting and adapting as our second homes, uh, that they had been immigrants here for a long time and therefore considered themselves more native than us to this country, to this land. Um, fast forward years later, as I was writing my um, the book that I'll be reading from, my memoir, Self-Portrait in Bloom, uh, this memoir is actually a biography of uh, an iconic Iranian poet, Ahmad Shamlu, whose work I translate and who I knew personally as a young girl. Uh, I started to Google map and Google earth, uh, the locations in the city of Tehran, which is the city that I grew up in, in Iran, and the city in which I knew him. And that became a whole chapter. It became months long, a uh, few months long, uh, research as I was sort of spying on my own city that I haven't been to in 38 years. So that sort of obsession with home and not being able to go to home or choosing not to go home started, you know, it took place as a, as a book in 2019. But since then, uh, the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back was uh, a, a panel discussion that I observed. It was a Canadian, during a Canadian uh, a literary festival, and it was two people who were from the Middle East um, who were being asked in a very sort of precious tone about their home by this European uh, Canadian woman. And I, I had to stop that. And it took me a few years. Once I uh, I went to this the country of Georgia on a Fulbright fellowship to write a book, a historical book that is partially set in Georgia um, and is, is about Georgia uh, partially, uh, I everything sort of came together to me because I was near my ancestral home, which is Iran. I was not going there, but I was also away from the United States, which is where my second home or my current home or my mo more long-term home has been for many years. And I was able to sort of cast a glance, proper glance at what home actually meant and what that I could put into words, what this repulsion against um, the notion of home in a way being in a way weaponized against people who are immigrants. A few months ago, I was walking uh, in Fort Mason and I walked by the new SF camera work, uh, beautiful gallery. And I was drawn into this by stunning visuals. And I found out that those visuals were by the artists that we're in conversation with tonight, Kija Lucas. Um, she has an exhibit there that's, uh, that's up for another couple of weeks at SF Camera Work in San Francisco called A Taxonomy of Belonging or The Taxonomy of Belonging, Kija will let us know. And there are incredible scans of various clippings, plant clipping, clippings, and other things. And I've asked, I immediately contacted Kija and, and asked whether she and I could be in conversation together because I thought that what she was doing in visual art was very, very similar to what I was doing in terms of my also new writings, which I'll be reading you a little bit from uh, later in this conversation. And Kija and I now are here with you tonight. Um, I would love to invite Kija to do a slide show. If, if many of you, if some of you have not seen the show yet, I would love for you to, to invite you to watch the slideshow that Kija has for us to see a little bit about, about the, to hear a little bit about her project and the visuals that she's created. Kija? Okay, I'm gonna try to make this in a way that um, you can see the whole thing. Do you 
Oh, I think it's control F. Oh no, control L. Sorry. All right. Is it taking up the whole screen? Okay, cool. Um, so I usually start with this quote when I talk about my work, but first I wanted to thank uh, Neil Farr for having me here with you. And um, it's been really exciting to get to know your work a little bit. And I feel like I have another question that people ask me and that is, what are you? <laughs> and what nationality are you? And what kind of name is Kija? And so I feel like it's a very similar feeling that I get because I, I understand the question that they're ask, actually asking when they ask those questions. Um, but I'll start with this. This acute awareness of tradition is a modern phenomenon that reflects desire for custom and routine in a world characterized by constant change and innovation. Reverence for the past becomes so strong that when traditions do not exist, they are frequently invented. Um, in my bio, when it says um, the ideas of home, heritage, and inheritance, I'm not talking about the money that you get in the bank from your parents when they pass away or a home or something like that. I'm talking about things that we inherit through our DNA, through our um, through learning how to be humans through our family, uh, the way that my seventh generation great grandmother has everything to do with who I am today. Um, when I was in college uh, in art school at San Francisco Art Institute, RIP, um, I learned for the first time because I I didn't go to high school. So I learned for the first time there in an anthropology class um, about Carl Linnaeus and his taxonomy of man, um, the invention of race. And it was the first time I like really understood, had language to talk about the ideas that I want to talk about, uh, because I didn't really know, I didn't have proof, you know, and so there was a page in a reader that was Carl Linnaeus, who um, came up with the taxonomy of um, botanicals and animals, and then in the 10th edition of his book, Systems of Nature, there was taxonomy of man, and there it was um, laid out with the European uh, European males in the top of the hierarchy and then different people from other parts of the world with really um, stereotypes that we still hear today, um, just in their descriptions of, of who they are. Uh, uh, Linnaeus um, didn't travel the world himself. He depended on other people's descriptions. Um, I also grew up with a father who's a gardener. So I've always been really interested in plants. And this is sort of where these two things come together. Uh, I began collecting botanical specimens from my neighborhood in San Francisco at the time at first, and then my grandmother's yard. And then I traveled around the country to different places that were, were significant to my ancestry. Um, I come from a mixed race family. Uh, different parts of my family have experienced being in this country in very different ways. And all of their stories are my story. And a lot of their stories weren't stories that they shared. And so I was lucky enough to find a newspaper article and stories that my grandmothers had written down and be able to piece sort of piece together um, where to go. My mother then became really interested in genealogy. So now she like tells me where to go. Um, if you if you know the work of Anna Atkins, um, she made cyanotypes of botanicals and used Linnaeus's um, taxonomic names. Her work is the first ever photographic book, and so my my pieces, while they're um, while they're not cyanotypes, they are a cyanotype. I don't know. Probably some of you have made sun prints. You put an object on the light sensitive paper, put it out in the sun. And that makes the image. My works, I put the object directly on the flatbed of a scanner and um, and it makes an image. So it's not a direct to print, but it is a direct to, um, it is a direct on, you know, putting the object onto a thing. Here's Can my road trip. One? <laughs> uh, here's my road trip that I went on um, in 2013, which started off this project to go to places that were significant to where my ancestors were brought or, um, or move to throughout the United States. Is the image up or am I the only one not seeing it? Oh, you can't see the images? 
I just see the text, the first quote that you oh, no. read. Oh no. This is okay. not right. I'm sorry. It's okay, Keisha. <laughs> <laughs> I was like showing all of these. Anyhow, this is the Anna Atkins image. Um, can you see it now? Yes. Okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's so embarrassing. Um, here's the road, the, here's the map of the road trip um that I went on um 13 states in six weeks. I drove 5,000 miles by myself and stayed with related strangers. Um, some of the botanicals that I collected along the way. This is from um, Montezuma, Buxton, and uh, Grinnell, Iowa. And here's this uh, piece of dirt that I believe uh, Nilafar you referred to early on. Um, this piece of dirt is from Bristol, Virginia um, on land where my ancestors were enslaved. Um, more than one generation, um, I was able to find back to, I believe the early 1700s. Um, my great, great grandparents were on this land and I visited, um, I was able to sort of walk around and see, um, I went to a historical site and I was able to walk around and, um, and it was about two weeks into my road trip and uh, I forgot the card for my camera it's very embarrassed when I asked the people who were who were uh, working there if it would be okay for me to come back later on my own. And um, I, um, I was really questioning myself whether or not this work was something that others would be interested in. And I, um, I was back there late in the afternoon. It was Virginia, the South in the summer is very hot. I was sweating through my jeans and my eyelids were sweating and I was packing up everything in the car. And I, um, I saw the sun shine through the gray sky, the clouds like opened up and the sun shine through onto this clump of dirt that was dug out from below a house that was being rebuilt. Um, on this land and this dirt was from beneath the foundation. And I looked at that dirt, it was almost like in the movies when the sun's just shining through the clouds onto something and you can almost hear it sing like, ooh. And I walked over and I picked it up and I was like, that's my fucking dirt. And I took it with me and made this picture. And this is the first photograph that I made from the series that I was like, okay, I know what I'm doing now. Um, my ancestors labored for free on that land and they sweat and bled into this dirt. And so I feel like my DNA is in there, you know, mm -hmm. in that, in the, in the land there. So that is um, some of my work. I'm going to stop my share now and um, leave it to you to go ahead and read. Thank you. Uh, Thank for, you for letting me know. That's okay, Keisha. Uh, that, uh, that image of, uh, is a really large, what is it like six, five foot by three foot uh, scan? Is that is that how big it it's, is? It's forty. It's forty by forty by, sorry, thirty by forty inches. Mm, it um, seems so, so yeah. much larger at the gallery. Uh, that was the first image that when you walk into Keisha's exhibit, that's the first image that you see. And that clump of earth, the significance of that clump of earth resonated really a lot with me. Um, and of course, there are so many other slides that Keisha could, Keisha could have shown today, but we are so limited on time. There are just clippings, botanical clippings that are exquisite, um, absolutely exquisite works of art. Um, but that clump of earth really resonated with me because I was constructing a historical novel and the historical novel that I went to Georgia to write was about uh, land, land inheritance. It's about you know, how this piece of land goes for it through four generations and what it signifies and how it's lost and regained and, and all that. But when I, of course, when I got to Georgia, I think I mentioned it earlier, that's why I say, of course, um, I started to write a completely different book triggered by just being in Georgia, by being in a third place and that, that this rage and repulsion against being asked about home as an immigrant started to come into focus and I started to have language, mainly because at the time I was there earlier this year, the, the Ukraine war had just started and we were confronting, you know, we, you know, as a person who lives in Georgia, who li was living in Georgia, hundreds of thousands of refugees and uh, displaced persons from the Ukraine, Belarus and Russia. 
at the same time as there was graffiti against Russia and, and Ukrainian flags everywhere. So Georgia has a very interesting and uh, tense relationship with, with uh, Russia that we don't have time to get into today in this talk. But um, I started to think about uh, what it means for all of us to, to not be at home and yet try to make it home together. Um, and, and then I started to realize that Georgia, the city of Tbilisi, is not that far away. It's a one-hour plane ride from Tehran. It's a one-hour plane ride that I could not make. And it is the bane of my existence that I couldn't make that one-hour plane ride because I have chosen for 38 years not to visit Iran because if you're listening to you know, current events and the news, um, you'll know that it's been a despotic regime for the last 43 years. So 38 years ago when I left, I decided not to ever go back until it was safe to go back. And it's still not safe. That homeland is burning. It's going through an incredible transformations now. Um, but just not being able to make that one hour trip and then being around people who had maybe flown an hour to be in Georgia and take refuge from other things that were going on geographically in the region um, brought it all into focus. Tbilisi used to be called Tiflis, and I grew up in Iran hearing it be referred to as Tiflis, right? When, when, the, when the snow started to melt and spring sprung and summer came, the, the large boulevards had these grand sycamores that were just in full lush bloom starting at the end of spring. And I remember one day I, I came to my knees in public. I was walking, I may even still cry now. I was walking down Kazbegi Street. It's one of their larger streets. And it just hit me that sensation that you, you know, it's a, it's a sensory emotion of being in Tehran as a child and walking down these grand boulevards where in fact my father's work, my father's clinic was, um, and just having that same exact sycamore feeling. Um, and so I started to sort of think about how Georgia is my proxy home because I cannot have a home. Um, and that was a really powerful feeling. And I started to write this book that I will read from today with for you. Um, and it's just been nonstop. I couldn't stop writing. Before that, um, Kija has asked me to read a couple of paragraphs from uh, Self-Portrait in Bloom, where I uh, write about Tehran, when all I can do is, is uh, spy on it through Google Earth and Google Maps. So this is in the middle of the Tehran chapter where I where I'm, was obsessed with finding dimensions. You know, when you are living in a place when you're young, everything seems really large and you don't really know what the distances are between things. And so I was really obsessed with finding what the distance was between my childhood home and the poet Shamlu's home. And uh, surprisingly, we actually lived very close to each other and I never knew that. So here's just an excerpt. Tehran, city of soot, landing silently like snow on the shoulder of my mother's sleeve as she is gingerly exiting the passenger side of our car, impeccably dressed and with hands held at attention, fingertips glistening with fresh red polish soot, which she delicately blows off the cream colored silk and then boasts to my father of her ingenious calculation against the error of a rub off that would have ruined the pristine surface with a black and red streak. Tehran, city of slogans of festivals and cinemas, city of grand tree-lined boulevards, city of sycamores and elms, of shaded alleys of no significance city of storytellers and tea houses of working class districts and wandering showmen of olden days with their European city peep shows, Shahre Farang. I'll just show you what those look like. Shahre Farang, made of metal in the shape of an oriental castle with several holes 
through which images transported crouching viewers to exotic lands they would never visit. Tehran, city of summer siestas, my head on the bare, clammy torso of my father, home for lunch from the clinic, city of uniformed school children running to buses or cars. Tehran, city of child laborers and child beggars and street vendors squatting in cardboard boxes, sleeping alone on sidewalks, not immune to extortion by officials to allow them. City of bewildered peasants hanging themselves under bridges impoverished from the confiscation of their livelihoods by the authorities who rob their provincial dreams. Tehran city of the sick and addicted, cowering behind burning trash cans, splayed in toxic alleys. Tehran city of southern slums and shanty towns with bitter graffiti that reads, don't look, it will cost you too much. Tehran city of hungry grave dwellers of sewer pipe undesirables with gangrene or frostbitten feet. Tehran tinsel city of mullah money, oil money, city of Instagrammed nose jobs, flaunted Fendi bags, gangster hip hop poses and underground jam sessions, secret city of pool parties and catwalks, city of ski trips and chalets, designer vodkas and supercars, depravity and decadence, no different than Bel Air. I'll fast forward. There is a Tehran in my mind. I do not know if it bears any resemblance to the Tehran that exists. It is the composite city of the remote past, my own past when it was my present, and the city of now I only know from afar, in fragments, virtually. It is cities erased and cities erected to make the city of my imagination. It is the Orientalist city captured, romanticized, minimized, and gazed upon by the Western eye. It is the city in which I kissed a boy in the basement wearing a floral green shirt and jaded colored t-shirt after he silently air spelled the word "moch" or smooch with his index finger on the wall to baptize our kiss. Never mind that I was not born there, nor that I only lived there for less than 12 years of my early life. Tehran was, is, and always will be my city from time immemorial when stardust was cast across space to float for billions of years to coalesce into the primordial earthly larvae that left water for land to become a wandering hunter and gatherer who made stone sickles and painted cave walls to cross the grasslands of the Euphrates Valley and the steppes of Central Asia to build shelter in the Bronze Age to survive the massacre of Mongols to the embryo that was conceived in the summer of love to the lemon tree and then the stardust that I will become again and again. I was always evolving to be a Tehranian. I'll stop that excerpt here. Um, so this is a little bit of the, you know, the, the real um, rage and longing and the, the not belonging, but wanting to belong to the land of your genetics, of your ancestral land. Um, so this was, you know, from the 2019 book. When I was in Georgia, Georgia, of course, is two countries north of Iran. Between is Armenia. And of course, Armenia and Iran share a border. And I always knew that I would go from Georgia to the, to the border of Armenia and Iran. This was not an easy task to do. Um, it took a humongous amount of effort to find the right driver, et cetera, et cetera, not knowing the language, not knowing the country. Um, and uh, I, I got myself to the border of Iran and Armenia. And you know, when you ask people, what are you afraid of? Sometimes, myself included, sometimes you say, well, I'm afraid of standing at the edge of a skyscraper and then jumping. <laughs> 
just because of that weird impetus, right? Well, I was really afraid that I would actually cross the border and go into Iran. Um, I didn't. Uh, I was almost pulled in by the, the Soviet style, you know, horrible uh, Armenian police at the border. Um, but I wrote about it. I wrote about that that episode in this in this new work uh, that I'm calling for now Home Proxy Home. Prior to that, there is a whole other section, um, and I don't know if we'll have time for me to read that. A whole other section with um, well, I'll just read it very quickly. The scraggly guy who enters the ATM lobby after me and waits on a bench tells me it's a Georgian thing that the young woman in a crop top and high-waisted white jeans stands at my back talking loudly on her phone and looking over my shoulder as I'm trying to transact. She doesn't budge, despite me turning around to my, you are crowding me, please step back. She was in the same position with the, the man at the ATM before me. So I thought they were together and was confused when she didn't leave with him. I spread my body to crowd her back and turned to tell the guy that I've been coming to this lobby for a few months now in Tbilisi and nothing like this Georgian thing has happened, but that it would make sense a doctor I saw at the clinic in Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia, told me to undress and just stood there with her nurse glaring at me, arms crossed and grinning. In the US, they leave the room, give you time and a paper vest, then knock before entering. He asks where I'm from. I say, isn't it obvious since I've just demanded space in English, no less? No. I say I'm from America. He says he wants to go there one day. It's usual for me to hear this abroad. Everybody's like, USA, USA, wow, California. I want to say, and sorry, USA, USA, wow, California. I want to say, it's not what you think, but I don't. You should go. Are you Georgian? No, I'm Ukrainian. Oh shit. I should have known from his slouch. Here in the country of Georgia, thousands of refugees from Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia mingle, a gift of the Russian invasion of Ukraine that started in February, 2022. He had that Avare vibe. I'll get into that later. Light of possessions, untethered, in limbo, alof, bikar, a drifter floating in the wind. He translates, a grievance from an American, to a Georgian, by a Ukrainian, in Russian. She scowls and huffs out not too long after. He's kind of cute. I step out and wait on the front steps, staring at my phone as he finishes his transaction. He says he's from a war-torn city and yes, a refugee. He doesn't know if he can go to USA. I say, why not through Mexico? He says, yeah, sure, the black way, he says. I ask if he's okay here in Georgia. He says, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. I've been here before, but overall not okay. This is a variation on what the Iranians here in Georgia say when I ask if they're happy. Iranians leaving that religious dictatorship for a better life were allowed in for a brief time into Georgia in 2015. Now they're pestered at the border of a land that used to be in fact, part of the Persian empire during the Qajar era in the 19th century. Before the territories were ceded to Russia following three wars. I want to talk more, but it's awkward and he's on his way. And I say, good luck with everything. Uh, what else can I do? But hope that he was able to get money from the machine. He says he's going to, uh, to Europe to make it to USA one day. I'll make it one day. I'm going to fast forward. Because of my voluntary self-exile from Iran, I visit the lands in proximity of her, Georgia and Armenia. Once part of the greater Persian empire, these lands have ancient ruins built on the bones of my ancestors. I don't know why this is so important. In the end, the globe is one ancient ball and we all, we're all just dust, but the DNA demands 
specificity. It is a zombie marching home. After three months of finding many Tehrans in Tbilisi, the city of sycamore-lined streets just like Tehran, I travel south to Yerevan, Armenia. It too is full of sycamores. I'm here for one reason. My driver picks me up. We awkwardly walk to his dusty old Toyota Camry. When he puts my grimy red carry-on into his trunk, I notice a stained pillow and blanket. The back seat doesn't appear to have a working seat belt. I fuss and say, I can't drive in a car without a seat belt in it. There, I've already alienated the situation. He pulls over, but I'm on a mission. The gods have sent me an Armenian Iranian to take me to the Armenian Iranian border. My driver is a salt of the earth, middle aged man of no pretenses and easy disposition. As a young man, he moved to the U.S. from Iran for a few years, but the, he found the dog-eat-dog dog too taxing, so he came to Armenia. He is my brother in arms. Well into the ride, we have broken the tension. He says in Persian, your land, your own land is something else. He's talking about Iran. He's lived in Armenia for 30 years, but he'd go back to Iran if it ever became free. Another way Iranians say this is mamlekat nadarim, or mamlekatnis, which means we don't have a country, or this is no country for us. I don't care about sites on the way. I just want to be driven so that I can take in the landscape, the topography of my own dust. The road south is mountainous. First, we have a clear view of Mount Ararat, and little Ararat next to it. This mountain of the Armenian highland is the national symbol of Armenia, but it's now just on the other side of the border, the Turkish border, so close by. Tourists pose with it looming in the background on a platform with a carved out opening designated exactly for this memento. The lesser Caucas Caucasus are rolling hills within hills, at times downy green, at times velvety fawn dappled with trees. We too, Caucasians, ascend a series of mountains called Zangezur. The region was ceded to Russia by Qajar, Iran, according to the Treaty of Gulistan in 1813. We stop at these big bell towers and my driver tells me these bells were told to herald approaching enemy forces, hence the name Zang, which means bell, e is of, zur is force, the bells of war. <laughs> the landscape is bright green with yellow wildflowers and large rectangular patches of purple wildflowers. I see people up to their waists in one of the distant patches. It reminds me of the lavender fields of Provence in the south of France whose tiny roads I've drove through the summer before this in my large white Ford. I'll skip the anecdote about realizing one day in France that actually I was American, which I had never known for 38 years at all. 12 harrowing hours of driving through misty mountains, passing, dod uh, passing and dodging trucks that carry goods back and forth from Iran to Russia one overnight stay in a hellish motel with vagrant men and 30 minutes skirting the Armenian-Iranian border where the cretinous and ruthless border police make me delete all the photos of the barren, toxic dump that the area is, a stinking toilet of splattered shit, nearly confiscating my phone and passport. The border mountains are stony and bone dry. The atmosphere is apocalyptic. I narrowly escape. We backtrack behind a rusty metal shed and some burnt out car parts at the foot of electric barbed by wire fence. My driver and I scrape some earth from this borderland. But what difference does it earth make? I even forget the plastic bag in his trunk. I superimpose Iran onto Georgia 
the Alborz and Zagros mount ranges of Iran onto the Caucasus mountains of Svaneti and Racha, peak on peak, range on range. The Sycamores or Valyah Street in Tehran onto the Sycamores of Kazbeki Street in Tbilisi, swaying in the breeze on hot afternoons. Rainy summer sunsets, leaf on leaf, tree on tree. Ferdosi Street onto Rustaveli Street, epic poet onto epic poet, name on name. Grandmothers onto grandmothers, women in black listlessly carrying bags of groceries. Never a smile, grandmothers shouldering history, the Iran-Iraq war, when brother turned onto brother, even as we speak all over Iran. The dark 90s here in Georgia, after the Soviets bolted and all that was left was chaos. No water, no heat, when gangs pillaged. Men who smoke and carry nothing and everything. Streets on streets, country on country. Beautiful boys onto beautiful boys. Boys of no hope, boys of hope and no hope. Caged doves without flight. Boys of a tale that is not theirs. Boys abiding by the rules of ignoble men. Boys who will dissolve into history, unrealized as the plucked rose. Rosebuds of my heart. These boys of history, one boy who seals a city for me. Tehran onto Tbilisi, I am back at the calming green leaves high above boulevards. Tbilisi is the city of my parents' golden youth. I don't even want it as my own city. I want to bring theirs back, bring them back in time. The women who walk past me don't return my smile. The country outside which I dig doesn't invite me in. I reach for you, you cold mothers. I'll stop here. Thank you so much for reading that. Um, and thank you for reading um, the, the words on Tehran too. I just thought the way that you wrote about it was so beautiful and so whole in a way that just really felt like we know that you're writing about a loved one, something that is like very important to you and, and multifaceted there. Um, and it makes me think about, you know, San Francisco or the Bay Area and places that I love that have, um, you know, beautiful and also um, difficult things about them. Um, I'm Are you born ask, in San Francisco? I, I grew up in the uh, South Peninsula, but I've been in San Francisco from an, between San Francisco and Oakland most of my adult life. Um, let's see. Um, so the first question I have for you um, today is, um, well, I was gonna ask you about the beginning of the essay as well, but we, we missed that part. But um, starting with Georgia, um, what were when you went to Georgia for your full like right when you when you started on that journey? I'm curious, like what were you looking for, and then what is it that you found? That's such a good question. No matter how much I prepared and Googled Georgia and talked to Georgians um, here and abroad, um, I just had no idea what to expect. Um, what did I find? I learned so much about the region's history and the relationship. You know, I, I went, I, we live in one empire here. I went to the shadow of another empire. And that was really eye opening. Um, the question of identity for them is really very, very raw. And that I had so much sympathy for that. Um, they don't really know what it's what Georgianness is, because they've been dominated by empires for so long, and they've only been out of the shadow of Russia for 31, 32 years since 1991. So, um, 
it's very new for them. They don't really know what Georgia, Georgianness is. So I, I, I really understood that. Now, alongside home, we immigrants <laughs> um, are also uh, interrogated constantly about our identity. And I think a lot of people want to express and delineate their identities. I've never never been one to want to do that. I would rather just be considered a mammal or like stardust or something. I don't want to say I'm, you know, this and that and just bring it down to sub, sub, sub categories. Uh, but it was really, it was really palpable for them. So that's, that's what I learned. And I was very, very fortunate that it became a trigger for me to write the book, uh, parts of which I read for you right now. Um, it just, it was really that missing element, Kija. Like for years I had wanted to express this deliberate non-belongingness or this desire to belong, but this impossibility to belong um, on my own terms without being, without that, you know, uh, imperious, for lack of a better word, no pun intended, but pun intended, imperious sort of imperial gaze. Uh, because, you know, we, the empires are places where are countries or nations that that are responsible for the dis displacement of people who then they deign to you know uh, allow into their countries so it's something extremely perverse i think it's very very perverse to then get very precious about it and ask immigrants about their home i think that a good tactic would be to immediately ask them back about what it's like to live in empire and to be responsible to live an empire that is responsible for the displacement of so many people. Um, so that's, that's, that's what I learned. And that's, that's the gift that Georgia was to me. It's this book. Mm. Um, so I'm also curious because this is something that we have in common um, about the earth that you scraped from the border, although it's a very different piece of earth. Um, so the journey that you took with this um, taxi driver was really important to you and it was risky for both of you and it seemed very important for both of you and you ask in the end of that anecdote what difference does this earth make and I wonder what difference did the experience of finding it make for you? I think not caring so much about it was the more important part. Uh, we had to, I mean, it was really like a guerrilla situation. They were after us, the police, for some reason, because I was taking photos um, and they almost like pulled me in. You know, the, the border has two buildings. There's the Armenian side where you exit Armenia and then there's no man's land in the middle. And then there's the place in Iran that takes you in. And I just felt that they wanted to suck me in and they had, they had me by my wrist only because I was taking photos and the stupid soldier at the border had my phone in his hand and he couldn't figure out how to delete the photos and so he was getting angry so he was like passport passport and my driver but he wasn't a taxi driver he was a driver that was a friend of a friend from thousands of miles away and he was actually a professional driver by by profession like his father was the driver for the american embassy in tehran i mean this is like for years from a driver family i was very lucky um, to, to have him and but it was night driving through misty very high mountains without really a lot of infrastructure and roads with all those really big trucks coming down at us it's probably the second most courageous or maybe the first most courageous thing I've ever done I, for 12 hours it was like this nonstop. so I think the the importance of that piece of earth for me was that I went there, I went to the border, I looked at Iran, although if you think about it, no matter how you slice it, I was somehow in the old Persian empire the whole time I was there in that region. Um, and it didn't matter, okay? I didn't have that piece of earth. It was already at the bottom of my shoes. I had already ingested it, you know, uh, letting go of that immediately was the more important lesson that, that I think I came away with writing the fact that we can write about it is the most important gift <laughs> thank you um, thank you what about you when you when you uh you know because it's interesting because uh once you talked about it today earlier today you said oh this land this this earth is mine and my ancestors were here and all that and now that i'm reading out loud my writing from a few months ago uh, you know it is about like this this earth 
this is the ruins of my ancestors. It's, it's sort of very similar. What about you? Did, had you forgotten that piece of earth? What would have, what, what about you? Would well, you have? So it's, it's kind of, sorry, I interrupted you. No, go ahead. Um, it's interesting because when I think about it, I think about that one clump of dirt, but be, having my ancestors have been enslaved on stolen land as well. Like I also don't have claim to that land, but I also do feel like this dirt holds my DNA, this piece of dirt, and I don't have it anymore. I do have other objects that I collected um, during that time, um, but I left it behind after I made the photograph. Um, and I think that to me, it represents this groundedness, this understanding this finding of my roots a bit. Um, I feel like being part of this melting pot generation of the late seventies, I was asked to let go of my roots, not on purpose by anyone, but just the way that, um, that things were talked about, you know, we're all individuals in a melting pot and everything's just mixing together. And, um, and I feel like that sort of asked all of us to sort of forget where we come from and it it gave undue responsibility on our shoulders for um, generations of um, various experiences and so to me like finding my ancestors and finding that piece of that clump of earth was important in like just really understanding that I'm part of a greater history that I'm part of nature that I'm part of like a story that is longer than just, you know, when I was born. Well, in a way, I know we've both memorialized that clump of earth, right? Me in writing and you with that incredible scan. Everybody should go see it. It's so beautiful. I don't know if this is the time to open up the... Um, it seems like it could be a good time. I don't know. If, if you all have any questions from us, from both Kija and me, please uh, put them in the chat box. In the meantime, you were you were you were you going to ask me about rage? You told me earlier. Today. I was <laughs> going to ask you about rage. I was going to ask you um, because I believe in the beginning of your essay, you start with the con like the uprising that's happening right now, mm -hmm. and but I believe the rage goes on much longer than that for you. And I'm and I was curious if you would feel comfortable talking about that or if that was something yeah, important yeah. for you to express this evening. Well, I think rage, I think I think I heard somewhere that all women have rage, um, which would make sense because we live in like the matrix is patriarchy and the matrix is invisible. And then one day you awaken to it and you're like, wait a minute, every everything from the language, from the structures, domestic structures from every aspect of our lives is geared to create that hierarchy that we're somehow in in relation to we're women but what we're secondary in relation to to the, to the male and then on top of that we have you know people like me who are living um i don't know as a beige person whatever you want to call me in in the us where even though I don't think of myself as either a woman or somebody who has different skin color, um, I am made, I am treated with that. And it took me until a few years ago, I mean, we're talking about decades, to awaken to the fact that I had, you know, this, this being annoyed at the way I was treated, at the way I was belittled, at, at all of those nowadays as a term for it, microaggressions, all that. All of that started to make sense that, oh, I, I am living, we're living in conceptual and, and physical actual language that is absolutely, uh, it, it others us by virtue of its very nature. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you awaken to that and, and when you have years of not having language and, a, and a, a, you know, a social change, to allow that language and that space to be there to, to speak up against it, that's, that's pent up rage and pent up um, expression that's been, that's been there. And so I think that's, that's, what the, that's what the rage is about. And I'm not, 
I think there is a way to be constructive with rage. I mean, I'm, I'm writing this book, I'm writing other books, I'm doing other things and, and to speaking up and speaking out uh, when you feel like, you know, those, those old structures and, and rhetoric uh, doesn't, it's, it's so outdated. <laughs> it's so outdated that I, I think that not just, this isn't just for, for women, this is for all of us citizens to learn to, to reframe for ourselves, not to be in relation to each other in that way. I see some, some things in the chat box. Let me see, I'll go for the first one. I feel like there is something raw in both of your works that we've seen heard like a contained rawness. Do you agree? Do you agree, Keisha? There's something Maybe. raw in your work. What, is there um, something raw in your work? <laughs> perhaps, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, perhaps, I'm not sure if it's um there's probably is something raw in me that create that causes me to want to create the work so i guess i guess so how about you i, I would i would probably re rephrase that raw the word raw to truth it's it's about getting to the bottom of your truth i think that's probably what tony uh you might be referring to as that rawness it is about just you know, I, a few, it was maybe about 10 years ago, I realized what my real job was as a writer, uh, aside from learning craft and engaging in innovation with words, which are my, they're literally my tools, um, was that if I, I had to be extremely vulnerable and tell the absolute truth of my humanity, because only then it could be of use to others. Why else would somebody read or consume art. It's mm -hmm. so that they, they can learn something about themselves or they can feel literally less alone. And so once mm -hmm. that clicked for me, it was like no holds barred. I will, I will get to the bottom of my human experience, that specific experience, because you can bet that it's a universal experience. If I'm feeling it, everybody's feeling it but the, the the challenge there is to really understand how you're feeling and really understand what those impulses are like i said i had had that repulsion against being asked about home or watching people be asked about home because i just instinctively never put myself in those positions as far as i can remember um but I just didn't have language for it. And it took years and years to sort of understand exactly what the feeling was, what the reaction was, what that counter narrative was um, so that I could be specific with it. So I would just change raw to true. The next question is, what are you working on now? And do you have a favorite poet? <laughs> William asks that. I'm working on this book. Um, um, do I have a favorite poet? No, but uh, the poet that's not leaving me alone is Ahmad Shamlu. You should look him up. Well, if you if you get this through the library, if you loan this or get this on loan through the library, um, you'll see it's the biography of, it's really the literary biography with selected translations of um, the 20th century Iranian poet who was actually nominated for the Nobel Prize in 1984 when I was a teenager and he was at our home. Um, Ahmad Shamlu. Let me see if I can. I'll uh, everyone. So that's whose work I continue to translate. And I've also co-created a, 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 an opera with the composer Alexander Rybalov and the director Roy Rallo, inspired by his effect in my life and his poetry and the metaphors in his work and the imagery in his work. It's called Abraham in Flames. And that's available for uh, for viewing on YouTube for free for everyone. I don't know if there are other questions, but Anissa, do you have a question? Or Keisha, do you have a question? Is there anything else that we've forgotten to to cover? I'm like, I can, I have plenty of questions. I don't know. Um, Please, Keisha, one more, like, at least. Um. So. I um I have read some of your books, Self Portrait and Bloom, and actually watched part of the opera as well. And um, you often collaborate and create that work that defies media. Are you're a writer and a translator and create performances and 
Do you know um, which form or which hybridity um, this project is going to take? Do you plan on taking it outside of the novel or this um, one? Yes, this one. Yeah, um, I think it's. I intended to write fiction. <laughs> So the work it's, is going to tell okay. you what it's going to do. The work is becoming like nonfiction again, just like Self-Portrait in Bloom. But this time there's a section that I write about a specific person and I have to fictionalize. I can't expose, uh, you know, I have to fictionalize it. So, and as you noticed in the last section of what I read, it's more, you know, there are line breaks and it's more lyrical, just like sections of Self-Portrait in Bloom. So I think mm -hmm. that might be called the P word, poetry. Mm -hmm. um so it's just you know i think of all of it as text i don't really think of the the the, the form or the genre i shouldn't say form i don't think of the genre so it just comes out the the content dictates the the genre and the form of it so uh but i do think it's mainly going to be nonfiction. it's going to be hybrid nonfiction again <laughs> Um, William, that's literally my home. <laughs> yeah. William's curious uh, what's meant by a hybrid work. Do you want to? In in my in my work, and Keisha, you can maybe you could talk to it uh, to hybrid as well in visual uh, work. In hybrid is when the pup, you know, uh, you. This is it. It's nonfiction slash poetry slash translation. In fact, we could have had many more slashes like uh, literary criticism, uh, photo essay, you know, because there's a lot of photos in this book. So a hybrid to me is um, mixing different kinds of writing, different kinds of text. Um, some of it fiction, some of it nonfiction, some of it poetry, uh, you know, even some of it, uh, photos and you know the the opera that I mentioned earlier Abraham and Flames is sort of the operatic version of this book it's about becoming so Keisha another I forgot to tell you I don't know if you know but my first book is called Belonging so mm. when I saw your <laughs> taxonomy of belonging <laughs> that was that as well immediately but uh you know the opera is kind of a operatic version of this which is really about belong uh, becoming and becoming in the presence of greatness, in the presence of art. Um, uh, so yeah, so that's what I think of hybridity. Do you have um, um, in your work? I, I, I do sometimes work in a bit of social practice, but it, the outcome is always photography. It seems, I'll try to start to do something that I think is going to be a little bit different, but the outcome is always photography. So I do have a body of work called um, uh, the Museum of Sentimental Taxonomy, and um, I photographed um, sentimental objects of over 500 people, like probably around 3,000 objects altogether, um, and it's exhibited as printed images on a website, and then also um, I interview people as I'm documenting the objects that they bring to me, and it's kind of about what we value and um, whose stories are told and what is considered important in museum institutions so um yeah that's great so <laughs> when you say you you you're so you say i'm a photographer i always think i'm going to start some you know at least with this project you said i think you said that you started it as something else but it became photo photography what were you starting it off as well it was always like part photography but it was like oh there's a there's a installation component and there's also a um, a social practice component. So I'm, I'm working with people from various communities. Like I've traveled to five or six cities around the country to like document objects. And so the conversation is part of it. And I always thought, thought like, oh, maybe I'll put a little bit of that in there. But in the end, it ends up being like installation and photography, but most, but it's all, it's all photographic work in the end you know so that installation cool. did you have the interviews did you have some snippets from the interviews about the mm -hmm. objects those are available on the website it's installed kind of like a museum so there's large framed works that have multiple images or multiple objects on it on an image and then 
images and vitrines that have multiple objects in them as well. So you kind of look at them as if you were looking at an object in a museum. Yeah, I love that. And I think Tony, uh, Tony says, oh, that's interesting, intimate. That's exactly the, the word that came to mind as well, Tony, if you're referring to Keisha's um, specific project here. That is very intimate. <laughs> yeah, it definitely. Um, it, it made me have to, I'm a little bit shy and it made me have to like be like, okay, I have to ask people for things, you know, and I have to, um, I have to be the one who is, is here and making someone else feel comfortable. So I had me to like, I couldn't just be a person alone in my studio, like making photographs. I was like, okay, I have to be in conversation and make the room feel safe for someone to feel willing to share, which I think was really special for me. And it's ongoing. I, I think I'll do this work forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a way to connect, right? Because as a photographer, I mean, this is, I think it would be, I love taking photos with my iPhone. I think it's, it's the best thing I do with my iPhone is taking photos is because you kind of become, uh, you know, a peeping Tom, which I love to be as a writer. I mean, that's what I am. Uh, let's face it. Let's be honest. That's what, that's what a writer is. It's like, you're just constantly observing. <laughs> um, but the best thing I do with my iPhone is taking photographs, but it kind of distances you, right? It sort of puts you at this very, very specific other position to the rest of the environment. So maybe that's your way of sort of connecting, right? Connecting with your um, subjects. Yes, definitely. Definitely. When I was younger, I would be, I would bring a camera to a party because I, that would be my protection. I would, I would photograph and have this space between me and other people. And then I decided no longer to do that. And I also, you notice there's no humans in my photos unless it's like a picture out of thing with other folks, but not not in my art. And um, so the the objects became stand-ins for the people and, um, and really thinking of them as like portraits of a person and their experiences. That's interesting, yeah. portraits of person and experiences portraits of experiences that's that goes back to the clump of earth also when you said did it did it what did it mean that I didn't bring it the experience happened anyway like it's not lost mm -hmm. yeah you know so um yeah the portrait of the experience I love that I love that uh phrase thank you whoever's doing that oh the Anissa you're doing that putting our Instagram um links there to, to connect with us um I, I don't know if you have more questions or not, but uh, <laughs> thank you, Anissa. If there are no other questions from the attendees. Yeah, I think the questions have, and there was some um, thank you and a very interesting talk and some other love in the chat. So I appreciate you all being here tonight and you know, both of you are amazing. Um, I always, you know, I always get energy from other women and just their creativity. And I would never, no, I won't go there, but I would maybe would never book another man if I had to, didn't have to. But I, I do love, I do love, you know, working with women and you are the intimacy. And I think, you know, Tony said raw. I just think, you know, it's just very honest. Yeah. So both of them. Yeah. So library community, Kija, Nilofar, thank you so much for being here tonight. I appreciate you all and we'll see you again. Thank you, Anissa. Thank you, Kija. Oh. And thank you all of you and the yeah. library. And go see us. Kija's exhibit. It's It's been extended until December 23rd. So 30. there's yeah. plenty of time. Yes. And we'll hope to see you both again. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, so thank you Anissa. Have a great night. You too, Bye. everybody. Bye.